Uh, our next speaker, uh, Professor Bram uh, Wonderbolt. Professor Wonderbolt obtained his uh, PhD from the uh, VUB in 20, uh, 2007. He once did his research at uh, GRL Lab in ARST Japan and did his postdoc at the Italian Institute of Technology. Since 2009, he is a professor at the uh, VUB. He had an ERC starting grant and is currently coordinating two EU projects on smart materials for soft robots. Uh, his research interests are human robot collaboration for applications for healthcare and manufacturing, uh, like uh, exoskeleton, uh, uh, social robots, uh, drones, and cobots. Today, he will talk about how to combine AI, uh, model based control, and uh, embodied uh, intelligence. Please join me in welcoming um, Professor Brian uh, Wanderbolt. Thank you. Uh, so I'm indeed Brian Vanderbilt from the University of Brussels, and I'm also affiliated with IMIC, which is a large institute on microelectronics, because uh, Microcontrol has become more and more diverse and robotics is of course an important uh, application. I'm not an AI specialist, I'm a mechanical engineer, so we like to build uh, robots, but of course AI is uh, very useful and that's why I chose the title, I need somebody, because uh, I think the design of smart bodies is very important to outsource intelligence from the AI to uh, the body, moreover, uh, we think that collaboration, that we need somebody to interact with, is also important to face societal uh, challenges. So uh, for a long time, there is the mind-body dualism of Descartes. Descartes, we said that the mind is the thinking uh, thing, which is completely different from the body, which is the non-thinking uh, thing. And that, of course, uh, is often the computer metaphor of thinking. Uh, uh, where you have an input, uh, then the mind and an output. And often in applications like AlphaGo and IBM Watson, uh, the body is even uh, not present. Eh? So the chess players uh, had to move themselves the, the, the uh, places or AlphaGo, uh, IBM Watson, that was a screen as output. Uh, but also this uh, metaphor is often used in uh, compute in robots where you have the sensors uh, as an input and the actuators as an output and they form uh, the body, but it's still uh, in many industrial applications. Uh, this is a slave uh, of the mind and the processes is done on uh, the robot. But that also uh, causes challenges uh, when to control uh, robots, for example here, uh, when there is an obstacle, in this case a coconut, uh, that is destroyed by the robot's uh, arm why a coconut, it's about the same force as needed to crush a human uh, skull. So that's why it's uh, far too dangerous to keep those robots in close collaboration with humans. And those uh, industrial robot applications are kept uh, in uh, cages. And so it's important also the paradox of Moravik and I think Professor Zahn showed many applications uh, where still uh, humans are outperforming uh, uh, robots. So here we see the DARPA robotics challenge with the compilations of all failures. Uh, but of course, it's uh, quite funny, but it also shows that the human body, and I think in a sports university as uh, here, uh, the human uh, body is still uh, so important. The capabilities of our body uh, to handle huge shocks, to move very energy efficient, in our environment and also to do this in a very safe way. Uh, for us, that uh, gives two lessons that first of all, the human body is still a rich source of inspiration to build uh, better robots. Uh, and moreover, uh, what there are complementary strengths. Eh? So a robot is very good in not becoming tired in doing very precise things, handling huge amount of data well, uh, humans are far more dexterous uh, and it, uh, can, uh, are much more uh, flexible and so on. So that's why the second lesson is why don't we combine the complementary skills of the robot and uh, the human and we go to human robots uh, collaboration. And for example, uh, 
this is a very old movie. Uh, that's why it's also rather fake. It's also a bit a cruel uh, movie because it's a decerebrated cat. Uh, so basically, the main part of the brain is disconnected uh, from the spline. And you still see that the robot is able to walk, run, and show different gait patterns while not having a brain. So where is the intelligence uh, of this cat? So it's clearly not only in the brain, but also in the spline, in the way <clears throat> there are the reflexes, the shapes, and forms and morphology of the bones, <clears throat> the muscles, and so the whole body of uh, the cat. And that uh, uh, body is formed over millions of years of evolution uh, in order to be optimized uh, for working in the environment and the tasks that the cat has uh, to do. And I think that's also a huge uh, evolution that we still need to see in robotics that also the body uh, should much more improve and not be seen as a slave of the artificial intelligence uh, system, but should work in collaboration uh, with it. And so this idea is also, uh, Asimo is retiring, uh, I understood. It's, uh, I think it inspired a lot of roboticists over uh, the decades, but it's that typically a very well controlled, uh, a high power uh, robot. And so it has huge batteries and it's very versatile. It can run, make circles, drink coffee, uh, shake hands and all those kind of things. But in order to do so, it, huge, it requires a huge amount of computational effort uh, and also energy. And that's why it runs out of batteries quite soon. While on the right, you see a whole new uh, different type of uh, robots and this robot even has no control has no sensors and has no activation and that's why it can walk down a, a slope and it's just a mechanically tuned uh, smart system in order to walk over level ground uh, you need at least to overcome friction and impact losses so there the sensor is very easy if you touch the ground then a small motor often a pneumatic muscle let the other wing uh, 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 leg swing to forward and you create a very natural uh, looking walking robots uh, very energy efficient but it can only walk with one walking speed it has difficulties to start and will crash uh, when it needs uh, to stop so hardly possible to let it bring coffee uh, but this is also a bit how the human body functions a combination of those two approaches and that's the reason why we can walk so energy efficient. It's also the reason why it's so challenging to lose weight uh, while uh, walking because it's just amazingly energy efficient, but still we have the versatility of Asimo and even more to negotiate very complex uh, terrains. And so like walking is a set of pendulum motions that swing, uh, running is kind of a bouncing uh, ball. And here it's, uh, Oscar Pistorius, at the time, it was still allowed uh, to run next to our Belgian runner, uh, Borlet in the Olympic Games here in London. Uh, and so it was amazing that an athlete with no legs, uh, so he has two uh, springs, very energy efficient, uh, was able to participate in the regular uh, Olympic Games. It was also the 400 meters because, of course, he didn't have the muscles to accelerate as easily as the others, but his two legs were very energy efficient springs because during running uh, the leg acts like a spring and uh, like a bouncing ball uh, that very energy efficient can store and release uh, energy uh, to run. And so, but when uh, these springs are tuned to optimally perform at a certain speed and because of the mechanics of that spring. So when he goes regular uh, walking, then he returns to his uh, regular uh, prosthetics and this is like walking with closed ski boots i don't know if uh, you do skiing but if you close your ski boots uh, it go your ankle is immobilized and you will feel that walking goes much more difficult it consumes much more energy uh, it goes slower uh, because your ankle is immobilized and that is exactly the feeling that traditional amputees uh, feel but in order to replicate uh, a prosthetic leg with a motor, uh, and I come from Belgium. So if you place two uh, boxes of beer on your hand, 
the torque you feel in your shoulder is what every uh, step you produce uh, during walking. And in order to reproduce that with a motor, uh, you need a few kilograms of electric motor in order to produce the same amount of torque and energy of a sound human leg. And of course, that makes that there is so much mass on your leg that the rest of your body consumes so much energy. And that's the reason why uh, amputees are still similar as the one just after the Second World uh, War and haven't been developed a lot. So what we do is we look uh, a lot how uh, humans walk and we store and release energy in our muscles. And that's why in this uh, prosthesis, we have also uh, springs incorporated, which stores and release energy. We have locking mechanisms in it, so it can store at one instance and release the energy at another uh, instance. And so this uh, prosthesis uh, can produce similar uh, torques and powers like a sound human leg, uh, but with a much lower uh, weight. And now these uh, 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 pa those patterns are in our spin-off company, Axilis Bionics. And we hope that in a few months, their first product will be uh, released. It's also a medical product, so it needs a lot of certification. So it's not such an easy product to bring uh, on the market. Uh, we also, uh, that was uh, mostly a uh, prosthesis for amputations below the knee. We also produced uh, of producing uh, prosthesis for amputations above the knee, where also similar concepts are used that through the knee, a lot of torque is uh, needed, but we use a locking mechanism. Uh, so not all the weight goes through the motor and consumes a lot of energy, but is uh, stored in parallel with uh, the, is going in parallel uh, over the mo knee motor and as such drastically uh, performs uh, energy saving. We participated uh, with this uh, prosthesis, also the previous, in the Cybertron uh, event. It's kind of Olympic Games for persons with a disability, but helped with technology in which we had to do several uh, tasks. And we had a 59-year-old uh, pilot. And at this moment, you see that uh, he has a kind of uh, uh, touchscreen uh, available. And every time he had to negotiate a different obstacle, he had to touch uh, which uh, control scheme uh, would uh, start. And that's of course not very handy. That's why we're now working also on AI uh, learning methods in order from the IMUs, from the uh, prosthesis in order to determine in which gate phase we are. So in which phase of the gate we are because touch sensors are not uh, switches to detect when the heel is from the ground, for example, are not reliable because they damage quite easily. And also to know in which gate we are, are we climbing stairs, are we walking level ground, stopping and so on, so that uh, it's not uh, needed anymore. So this is an example where we do uh, smart designs and we try to make the behavior of the prosthesis as close as possible with the desired prosthesis. Then we do model-based control, but then where we cannot find the model, say like in which gate uh, we are and so on, with uh, use uh, learning uh, methods. So prosthesis are there in order to replace missing limbs. We're also developing exoskeletons in order to enhance, uh, for example, walking in order, for example, for rehabilitation, but also to assist workers to work in non-ergonomic uh, postures like above the head or lifting heavy uh, objects. And also here we try to make the design as light as possible, as energy efficient as possible, because you cannot carry a lot of batteries uh, around. Moreover, uh, the human body is a very complex uh, shape. Our bones are very complex. And that has, you have to uh, assist with uh, exoskeletons, which are often thin joints. But where is exactly when we see to the elbow, at which rotation point, point we rotate? And that's a, a big uh, Question because hey, we have a lot of fat muscles around it. So finding the exact position and aligning the exoskeletal rotation so there is no misalignment is a big problem. Moreover, hey, we have uh, not pin joints, but we have rolling contacts. So the exact rotation point also differs when our bones are rotating. And that's why we developed mechanisms that automatically compensate those misalignments. 
that also makes that we can provide assistance in one direction, but the, the person is able to move freely in the other positions because sometimes other exoskeletons that they can assist motions in one direction, but they restrict other motions. So that makes that the versatility of the uh, worker is uh, lost. And so uh, this uh, exoskeleton uh, for the upper limbs, uh, we test it in uh, factories like, for example, Audi, but also other factories. Moreover, we closely collaborate also with the human physiologists to measure the impact of the exoskeleton on the human body. And we also measure other exoskeletons. So that means we companies ask us say, which exoskeleton to use. Uh, it's having like different cars, say, if you want to drive fast or have the working on the field and you don't use the same uh, vehicle and you optimize uh, the the choice of which vehicle for which task, but it's exactly the same with exoskeletons. So we replicate typical motions that are, for example, in a warehouse or uh, in car glass where uh, people have to put uh, new windows uh, on a car that are all different motions. And then we test those uh, motions with different exoskeletons and measure physiological parameters in order to advise the company which is the optimal exoskeleton to use and that gives us also a lot of insights how to improve those uh, exoskeletons. So these are uh, passive uh, exoskeletons so there are no uh, motors in it and here you see in the back for example the springs so if the, the arms move up energy is released from the spring in the arms and, and stored back. While the other exoskeletons they contain motors so also here <laughs> We're combining now active elements in it, but that also means we need to control those uh, uh, motors. And so we need somehow to detect the intention of the human body in order to control uh, the exoskeleton. And you can use, again, graphical user interfaces, but of course that are not very handy. Another way is to uh, use brain machine interfaces but we don't think they're at the moment very reliable to use in daily uh, work. So that's why we are going towards a new generation of sense, soft sense rights interfaces, where in the interface between the exoskeleton and the body, we integrate uh, different types of sensors, pressure sensors, uh, uh, EMG measurements, but we're also now going to, and that's the reason why I joined IMIC to 3D, uh, force measurements. So we don't only measure the force, but also the shear forces. Uh, we want to measure inside uh, the limb. And then we use intention detection algorithms in order to control hey, what is the person is doing. And here you see we are doing tests with a kind of robotic test bench, which can simulate the behavior of uh, exoskeleton, but in very different ways. So we can generate uh, uh, zero gravity, we can uh, increase uh, uh, the weight, we can uh, help the, the person and so on. So we can generate a lot of behaviors using uh, such a cobot, which acts like an exoskeleton. But uh, this concept uh, of sensorized interfaces and using as a cobot, uh, here it's used to, 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 to train the AI algorithm uh, to do the intention detection. But we are recently also uh, finalists for the KUKA Innovation Award to turn that ID into a rehabilitation uh, device where we use the same uh, test setup, a sensorized interface and a robot, uh, the cobot as a much cheaper uh, rehabilitation platform. So now we're uh, working hard to go to the finals during the Medica uh, Fair uh, in uh, Germany at the end uh, of this year. So it's again a combination of using a smart design, model-based control, and where we don't have the model available anymore, for example, for the intention detection, to try to use AI algorithms and let those three work in a synergy. Then uh, it's all, we're also developing collaborative uh, robots. And at a certain moment, Audi Brussels, uh, at that moment, producing the A1, uh, had several issues with the glue operation to reinforce the roof 
uh, of the car to put the, the, the bikes on the back. And because it was a human, uh, the glue was not always enough, too much glue. And since Audi is the premium brand, that led to a lot of quality issues uh, uh, in the car. And then, of course, that, car, that body had to be taken out of the assembly. Since there was not enough place on the assembly line for robots, uh, we uh, thought to have a new device. They also wanted to see what is the impact of cobots on their manufacturing floor. And that's why they uh, came to join us. But when we first uh, came in the factory, we really saw that workers were afraid that the new generation of robots would take out uh, their jobs. That's why from the very beginning, we also involved sociologists uh, in the project. And so they investigated how a worker should work together, what are the desires of them in order to collaborate uh, with the robot. And they saw in Audi Brussels that social interaction is very important, but in a factory there is a lot of noise. Moreover, Belgium is a country with many languages. So that's why uh, it turned out that nonverbal communication would be very uh, relevant. And so that's why you will see that the, the, the uh, worker will do gestures uh, with the cobalt, uh, a five doors, a three doors, the left line, right line, uh, and so on. But in order that the robot would react, there was a uh, robot artist, uh, Jan de Koster, who developed uh, an inanimated head in order to also have a response non-verbally back to the, the worker. And so where in the beginning, the the workers were very afraid of a new generation of robots. Now uh, the sociologists find out that they are very proud to work with the robot. At Audi Brussels at that time, there were 800 robots in use. This was the only robot that got a nickname, for example. And because of this human-centered approach, there was much less uh, uh, being afraid of this new type of robots. And in the meantime, a lot of new robots were successfully introduced in the Audi factory because they also went from an, uh, producing the Audi A1 to the uh, Atron. And so uh, this human-centered approach we think is very important. And it was also unique that this experiment was much more than one year active on the actual production line of Audi Brussels instead of performing the experiments only in the lab. And that's also the reason why there is in fact no physical collaboration between the human and the robot. So it's work share, workspace sharing, but no collaboration because uh, we had huge liability issues uh, at the beginning uh, of the project. And that's why we decided to have workspace uh, sharing. But in new projects uh, like AU Sofia, uh, we're also working on improving the ergonomics of, of workers. Uh, and I saw uh, Professor Zeka also uh, working on ergonomics, but for uh, uh, surgery, uh, it's very important that workers work in an ergonomical posture and sometimes it's not always possible. So here we have a robotic arm and a Kinect camera monitors uh, the worker and checks his posture and adapts the workpiece so the human worker can always work in an ergonomical uh, position. One of the challenges of cobots is that they have to work very slowly in order for uh, safety and that of course harms uh, productivity. And so uh, that's why uh, we're also working on new control schemes in order to uh, uh, let humans work together uh, with robots. And so uh, therefore we need to do constraint handling because there are a lot of constraints uh, acting, it's like driving a car and you need to go from A to B, but you need to have a car and it has the maximum power, there is a speed limit, there are obstacles, you have to drive between lines, there are traffic lights. So that are all the constraints and how to uh, generate the motions uh, of the robots. And so typically this is done with model predictive control, but this is a computationally very heavy uh, method. And of course, for robotics, this has to be calculated uh, real time. And that's why our researchers are working on an alternative, which doesn't do an optimization, but it's a more reactive control. So it's also a bit more conservative. Uh, 
But here you see that it takes a lot of constraints into account. So you see that we put payloads on the end effector of the Panda uh, a robot. So to push it to the payload limits, uh, then it's uh, the idea that it uh, has to follow 30 centimeters above this plate. And then it has to avoid uh, this uh, human uh, that was also the first author of the paper. And you see the robot has a very reactive uh, and fast uh, behavior, avoiding uh, uh, the person. Of course, at this moment, we use a Viking uh, system. Uh, so that's why you have the reflective markers uh, on the body uh, in order to know where is the position of that human so the robot uh, can avoid her. And that is, of course, not of practical uh, use. And that's why uh, with IMIC, we're also now going towards a new generation of sensors in order from the body to sense where are obstacles and where are humans because vision is very popular, but of course it has also its limitations that it has occlusions uh, and so on. So we want to develop a new robotic scheme around the robot <coughs> in order to use it in a synergy with those control strategies, with the idea in order to make those robots much uh, faster and as such also much more uh, productive. So our vision is that uh, we want as much as possible to use model-based uh, control uh, because one of the reasons uh, like the previous model is also we can show uh, safety uh, uh, using Lyapunov uh, and so on. Uh, so it's mathematically proven that it's uh, safe, but of course not on all aspects, we have the, the models. And that's why we're also trying to see how we can implement, for example, a reinforcement learning in order, for example, to do an assembly sequence. One of the big challenges in robotics is that we don't have a lot of data, of course. Moreover, uh, that uh, making the robot move costs a lot of money and time and resources, especially in a production environment where we want to evolve away from mass production to mass customization, so that we want to uh, go to very small samples uh, Patches, so where, for example, something has to produce a few hundred times uh, or even less, of course, then you cannot train it with thousands uh, of times. And so that's why we're uh, going to methods where there is the human uh, available. So the human is available for advice. And so uh, we're developing uh, interactive reinforcement learning where the input of the human is used in order to increase uh, the speed that the robot uh, learns. Moreover, we're also uh, seeing if we can learn in the digital in the digital twin, so in a simulation. The challenges we have is that we need uh, correct or rather good uh, mechanics because uh, things can go wrong and there has to be collisions. If you have a pick in a hole, uh, then it has to be stable uh, simulations. And so here we learn in simulation, and these are videos, it's in fact not needed because you learn in simulation to show that uh, the simulations are in line uh, with the reality. And then we can you, uh, learn in the virtual environment, taking the physics into account uh, in order then to learn. And then of course, uh, the simulation is not a perfect simulator because in order to reduce the speed with its simplifications here, you only see the end effector, so not the impact of the whole robot arm. So once it learned a correct assembly sequence, then you can still do uh, modifications uh, uh, in order to improve uh, the speed that the robot can do. Here, for example, there in this pendulum, the advantage is that some has to do sequential, so one after the other, but also some tasks can be done in parallel and then it can be better to do first one red pack and then the other one, because as such, you save a little bit uh, of time. So this optimization is done during performing uh, the experiment uh, in reality. So uh, at the moment, our, most of our work is also working where there is a single uh, human and a robot that have to collaborate. But we see in a lot of uh, tasks, Hey, that the robot is not very versatile. Hey? That's why it's also in the previous example that uh, 
pendulum design because one gripper can handle uh, all the different parts. But first, often you need at least a screwdriver or another smaller part and a bigger part. And very often, hey, the robotic grippers or the robot arms cannot handle that. And the human is, of course, very um, versatile. So, but of course, a humanoid that represents it is very expensive. And that's why I believe that we need to go to collaborative robots where a lot of robots with very simple uh, uh, capabilities, but very diverse, have to work together in order to make a very versatile production. So that you have a robot arm that can screw, a robot arm that can pick up one thing, a robot arm that can pick up another thing. Yes. So that's why we um, want different robots to work together. And on the left, the agents know the positions of the other and that we share over the Wi-Fi with the Python system, uh, because uh, now we're also working with other PhD students on multi-sensor fusion to know and slam where is one agent and where are uh, the others. And but that in this video we still uh, sent over the Wi-Fi. But if we also on the right send information to where the drones are heading and so share the applied reference, then we can have a denser swarm, less distance traveled and smaller uh, settling time. And so the idea is that the whole, um, control architecture. And that's why we wanted to have very small drones. So the crazy flies, the whole system is running real time on those very small processors. Uh, and uh, so they're safe, even without any communication. So safety is guaranteed, but by communication, by collaborating, we can improve uh, the performances. Of course, real drones have, of course, much more process, I mean, that are real drones, but uh, other drones have much more processing power. But of course, also SLAM algorithms and other algorithms have to run on the microprocessor. So to show that our control method is very uh, uh, computational uh, efficient. And so now we're extending the work that not only they can uh, fly around together, but they can also collaboratively uh, take payloads in order to uh, uh, move uh, large objects uh, and so on. We want also to work together the cobots with the drones and so on, because it's that same uh, idea of the explicit reference governor that is behind the control uh, concept. And so this is again a model-based uh, control algorithm, but on top, eh, how to do task distribution, how to uh, do the path planning and so on, there are the ideas to use AI algorithms that work together. So safety on board, collaboration, uh, by increase for increasing performance and then uh, adaptability uh, by using uh, AI algorithms and learning new uh, performances. One uh, another important aspect, and it was already shown, is the need for sustainability and a circular uh, economy. So we're developing those soft uh, grippers, and they are becoming very popular to grasp uh, delicate objects like fruits, but also in collaboration with the human body. But of course, those uh, soft uh, creepers are very vulnerable uh, to sharp objects, to wear and tears. Uh, and that's why we're developing self-healing materials. So you can damage the material and they're able to heal uh, again. Moreover, yeah, the problem is, yeah, we cannot grow uh, new materials instead of the human body. And so when parts are not needed anymore, hey, they often end up as waste. Um, and it is, of course, also from an ecological point of view, not very interesting. Uh, but our materials, we can completely recycle them mechanically. Uh, so we can make them in small parts and, for example, print them again or mold them again. But we can even recycle them chemically. Uh, that means we can go back to the original monomers. And that means we can create new materials with other mechanical uh, properties of the material, for example. Moreover, we're looking for renewable sources and also for biodegradation. So even when the component would be lost in the environment, that it would not further harm uh, this uh, environment. And so this is a, a very strong collaboration with the material scientists, where we go from new materials development. And here you see under a microscope where the material uh, is healing uh, 450 times uh, faster. 
and we develop a whole portfolio of materials. So we can develop materials with very elastic behavior to rigid behaviors. Uh, so that means we can go to multi-material components like our hands, for example, right? they exist of bones, fat, tissue, nail, and so on. And all those materials have a role in our hands to grasp different uh, objects. And that's also what we can do is we can combine, due to the self-healing aspect, we can combine the materials with different properties and often when using classical methods eh, at the interface between different two materials, often the system will break. But we can show that at the interface that eh, the bonding is uh, perfect because it are covalent bonds, so they exchange electrons. And so we have a very strong connection between the different uh, materials. Moreover, we investigate different production uh, processes. Uh, so we can 3D, do 3D printing with the materials. Uh, which can means we can do prototyping, but we can also mold and do other uh, processes. So one of the advantages we can use, and, and but it's more for uh, chemical persons, that typically the, the plastics, uh, which are having less interesting mechanical properties, are, are the thermoplasts, and those you can 3D print. But the network polymers, which can have very interesting properties, you cannot use thermal processes to uh, repro to process them. But our methods can both use the reactive and the thermal processes to be processed. So we can use a whole gamut of processes to develop our materials and even combine them. So we can mold something and then print something uh, on top of it. Moreover, we are also investigating uh, conductive materials. So they can uh, be used as a sensor, as a strain sensor or as a uh, capacitive uh, sensor. Moreover, they can be used as a heating element because we develop autonomous healing materials. That means there is a damage, uh, and here you will see it in this video. So there is, uh, uh, we create damage in our finger, which is a pneumatic finger. And at room temperature, the material is able to, to heal. And so this is very interesting, but sometimes it's better to have non-autonomous self healing so you need a stimuli before uh, the system starts to heal. Because imagine you're harvesting mushrooms and the finger is dirty. Yeah, when there is dirt in your wound, yeah, then uh, that system will heal with the dirt inside and that's not very optimal. So then it's better to choose, okay, uh, it's damaged. And because we have the sensors inside, we can sense the damage and then we determine, okay, shall we continue with our task? or do we need to stop and uh, do immediately the healing or maybe with less force or with more energy, we can do finish the important task. And for example, wait till the night, we can clean the hand automatically and then do the healing. So the next day it's again back in service. And so to do those things for the sensing, for deciding uh, what are uh, the healing procedures, uh, we're also starting to use AI techniques in order to uh, do those uh, tasks. And one of the advantages, because we closely work together with the material scientists, and we do the whole value chain from materials, manufacturing sensors, and robotics in our uh, university. And that are also the two European projects I coordinate, Shiro and SMART. And we have now a third approved in order to increase the uh, the the volume, say, because we want to, uh, it's all large scale, so we want to increase the TRL level, the maturity of the materials, and also uh, go to a business plan in order to bring those materials uh, to the market. And for that, we got an EC transition grant from the European uh, Commission. So in order to do that research, uh, we need a lot of disciplines, uh, and that's why we developed robotics which is the robotics, but it's also the AI group uh, of Luke Stales, uh, which were pioneers on AI, uh, the sensor lab uh, and so on, but also the medical, human and social sciences are very important. And so in most of our projects, uh, the non-engineering uh, 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 fields are also involved in our research. Moreover, we work together with IMEC and affiliated to some with IMEC and Flanders Make, which is a research institute on the manufacturing industry in Flanders. And of course, the European project, other universities, startups, and companies. 
As a last aspect, eh, we think there is also, and the previous speakers also talked about it, about the ethical uh, aspects uh, of it. And so our uh, rector is very concerned about uh, that. And that's why we started Homo Roboticus. Uh, and it has asked question how we can preserve the human values on equality, freedom, and solidarity in such a robotized world. And 56 academics from our university from very different uh, fields, uh, often from our robotics, which had experience with robots, but also persons without them, like lawyers, tech specialists, uh, political scientists, and so on. We asked them to, to collaborate with us in order to write for uh, a general audience, uh, what would be the impact of uh, robotization and AI? And so we wrote a book with 30 thought provoking questions, uh, readable by a broad audience, and yet the end proposals for an inclusive robot uh, agenda. And in order to launch it in 2019 in the Opera de Munt, uh, we did uh, a big event and uh, where uh, we invited politicians, companies, uh, policymakers, uh, and academics to share the stage. We had a lot of demonstrations of our robot and we also invited artists. And one of them was a um, uh, bionic pop star, Victoria Modesta, and he had a nice uh, presentation. So I think the others will hear the sound. Uh, responsibility about innovation in the future is kind of becoming much more at the forefront and I feel like my job is to like inspire the mind and the imagination and we did also when people think that thinking about the future isn't for them that they are not good enough or smart enough to think about the future I think that everybody should be engaged with how the future of their life and the environment is going to be Thank you very much, so uh, so she said that it's very important that everyone should be engaged and that I think is also important that that it's a start of how we will uh, live together uh, with uh, robots so that are the points of the proposal. I don't have time enough to go over them, but they're available uh, in the book and open for uh, further discussion. So as a conclusion, uh, I think we need somebody with embodied intelligence, with a smart design to outsource intelligence to the body and link smart body designs, model-based control and artificial intelligence uh, algorithms to see for the whole control and the performance of the robot, and what system has to do what and how we can collaborate in order to make it as effective uh, as possible. Moreover, I need somebody that humans and machines have complementary strengths and to evolve towards human robot uh, interaction. So thank you for your uh, attention.